Hi again. <laughs> uh, I'm super excited to welcome all of you um, at the Curatorial Yards talk. Uh, I'm broadcasting from the studio, but I'm not alone, although I'm keeping social distancing with my colleagues. Um, I have a pleasure to welcome Anna Depong, uh, a curator of the uh, Digital Cultures Festival, curator of the interactive storytelling section. Uh, Pavel Schreiber, curator of the games section, uh, are here with me. And um, online, wow, hi guys, um, Anna Winkler, curator of the film section, together with uh, Michał Matuszewski, also online, Alexander Schultz um, from Holo Magazine, our main media partner and also a curator of the festival, and Joe Katz, straight from Sheffield, curator of the audio exhibition. Hi guys. Hello. Hi. Hey. Good Hi, to see hello. you. Good to see you. Good to, good to be with you. Uh, before we before we move on to to the discussion, I would like to um, tell our audience that we are open uh, uh, for your questions. So please ask questions online. Um, uh, you can be on Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. We can um, read your questions, and I will gather them um, at the end of the talk. But also, if you are um, watching us on Zoom, you can also join uh, the Q&A sec session with the camera on, so we will be able to see you um, here in the in the studio where uh, we where we are uh, at the moment. So um, please ask questions um, uh, during the the whole talk. Okay, guys. Um, this is a big moment for me, and I guess for you as well. We've been working on this uh, festival for a couple of months. Uh, I guess it was like five months or even more. Um, but I remember our first discussion about this year's festival and the idea that uh, we came up with. Uh, we were sitting in a cafe in Lviv. We just finished the, the This was the last five edition. months ago. We yeah, were yeah. sitting Lviv in a cafe. Lviv was 12 in months ago. Months. Yeah, and That's I think right. intensive work started early enough for us to yeah. consider whether we would be organizing a, a, a live event or an online event. So it must have That's been a, a long time ago, a lifetime ago. Yeah, that that was 12 months ago when we were in Lviv and we came up with the idea of this leading theme back then, I remember this. Uh, the world looked different uh, than now, nobody heard about COVID and we thought that imagined futures will be something that uh, we will talk about in different circumstances. Uh, but then when, uh, when everything uh, happened in 2020, I felt that this leading theme and this topic is um, more important than ever and that we can discuss about imagining the future although it's really hard to imagine very close future even you know um, in a weak um, weak distance of time but um, um, I'm curious and I would like to uh, hear from you um, uh, in the context of your parts of the program. Um, what do you think uh, we can learn from um, designers, story storytellers, artists and filmmakers? I'm looking at Anya and Michal uh, at the moment. Uh, while thinking about the future and while thinking about future scenarios for the future. Uh, are there any tools we can, we can learn from them to, to, to do it more accurately? Um, or to imagine more sustainable futures. Alex, maybe we could start with you and, when, and with, with the panel that uh, you curated. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, hi, I'm Alex. It's wonderful, wonderful to be with you all. It's a little weird setup because I can see on my screen like a smaller version of the studio. So <laughs> let's see how this goes. Um, yeah, I don't know about tools. Um, but um, what we can learn from artists, designers, narrators, um, storytellers, and any kind of creative practitioners is certainly um, an understanding that our capacity to imagine possible worlds and possible futures is sort of um, 
ruled by entrenched and entrenched and constantly reinforced narratives and ideologies. You know how how, how um, uh, about how the world works and about our place in it. So, and in particular, Western narratives uh, about growth, progress, you know, individualism, capitalism, um, and um, and you know, kind of cultural uh, superiority as well. In particular, have kind of defined and limited our imagination and in, informed what we sort of deem possible and acceptable, even in an imagined future. So, I recently came across the writings of American novelist Ernest Kallenbach. He's the author of the 1975 book Ecotopia. And he said that, um, and I quote, um, it is so hard to imagine anything fundamentally different from what we have now. But without these alternate, alternate visions, we get stuck on dense center. And we'd better get ready. We need to know where we'd like to go. And this is obviously very true, especially in this year. We need to know where we'd like to go. And it's really hard to imagine anything fundamentally, fundamentally different than what we have now. And yet we need to, right? And, uh, and this is something where I think artists and designers and storytellers can really help us um, through means of radical fictions, imaginary worlds that sort of follow, follow different rules, but at the same time also sort of suspend our disbelief about change, kind of to use the words uh, from uh, Bruce Sterling. Um, and, uh, and as they help us kind of recognize these dominating narratives and ideologies that we're all kind of entangled with and that we're all beholden to, um, you know, they can they can allow us to sort of challenge them. And um, yeah, and in many ways, I think this is what the panel that Holo has curated tomorrow is all about, kind of future as creative practice. And, you know, we invited a group of really, really good experts who sort of invent and imagine the future on, on a daily basis and for a living. So it, as it happens, we also have another, uh, when you were talking, Alex, uh, I was thinking that first I would really like to join the, <laughs> uh, uh, the panel. Um, but I was also thinking about the fact that, uh, you know, that um, we're living in a world which is not uh, for humans, but rather with humans. And whatever thoughts we have about imagining the future, uh, we also have to think about our role in the world. And um, this made me think about this uh, thing which we have in the program, which is in this amazing um, workshop run by Duncan Speakman, which is about um, uh, audio immersive experiences. And uh, I guess we're all kind of fed up with screens right now. And uh, I'm super happy that you were watching us on the screen. But we'll be also uh, exploring other ways to um, sense this world and to Im immense ourselves in this world. So uh, yeah, we have this audio immersion workshop for humans in this world, which we just kind of inhabit, which I would also like to welcome you to. Speaking about sound, segue. I think uh, Joe should jump in. Yeah, that's a wonderful segue. Great to hear uh, from Alex and uh, Anna there, a natural segue from one person to another. Um, and uh, uh, to complement Anna's note about um, online saturation, vid visual saturation at the moment, most of the artists in the audio program that the sound intervention service has come from a viewpoint of artists working in performance video and installation that have always considered the audience but have always allowed the institution that they exhibited their work in to do the, the rest of the work and so this time around we no longer just consider the work in the context of the online framework that it's in but we consider how does the audience relate to us and so going back to to alex's initial points of uh, how to imagine this uh, as a relatable futuristic uh, topic um the one, the one common area in the, the audio program between all the artists is they have adapted their works to suit an online process, but with a bespoke framework that the audience can find themselves um, uh, feeling uh, their own individualism. Uh, they are not experiencing it in the same way that someone else is experiencing work down the road or in another country. And uh, we actually have video artists over this last six months that have abandoned working in video art to go into audio because they have seen audio being a second, secondary art form compared, compared to the visual. And uh, here it's the, um, the primary primary art form. So very happy to welcome you all to uh, uh, this program as well, which will 
um, air uh, every evening from the 18th to the 23rd Central uh, uh, European time from 9 p.m. and then uh, three months afterwards. So welcome. Welcome. Pavel, how games can respond to this? Uh, I think they, they can respond to this in many ways, but I thought about one particularly interesting way, uh, which is uh, we all feel, perhaps not all, but most of us feel some sort of tension, some sort of fear. It's sometimes difficult to cope with it. Uh, and creating stuff has always been a way for people to um, overcome some kind of trauma, uh, to get it out of their system. Uh, and uh, I'm particularly interested in, not in the uh, big AAA high budget games, but these tiny personal games that everybody can make, that can express their fears, their anxiety. Uh, and there's more and more of that. And uh, this is an example of, uh, of a game called Continental Drift. It's a tiny thing created by um, um, uh, Cecile Richard, who will um, uh, have workshops uh, teaching people how to make such games. It's in a, this tiny uh, uh, video game engine called Bitsy. Uh, and it's a personal story about her moving home when she was a child. Uh, another project that uh, we're going to show at the festival is SAD RPG. SAD stands for sadness, of course, but also for social anxiety disorder. And it's, it's a game that presents this kind of experience. Uh, also with some, uh, you could see some overtones of lockdown. Here's the evil doors that uh, w when you want to exit your flat, right? We experienced that during the lockdown. Here's, it's an opponent you can fight. And this is a great way of, of as I said, coping with anxiety, coping with the problems that we're facing today, right now. Well, this is a continuation of the banana game, right? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, yes, the, the uh, said RPG uh, game is uh, made by an outfit called Evil Indie Games, and Anna remembers one of their games. They've always made really original things in, at a game show. Uh, they used a banana as, as, as a controller. So this is something that, that stuck with you. It was also a game about social anxiety, which you played by uh, touching a banana. Those of you who doesn't know, who don't know Anna, uh, don't know that Anna loves eating during our meeting. So I guess this is why you remember this title. She, she didn't eat the controller, though. No, <laughs> I, didn't. I hope so. <laughs> but I also hope that I was thinking when I was looking at uh, Cecil uh, Richards' work and at the workshop that she's running. So I was thinking about the fact that this is also a very inclusive tool, Bitsy, and it's something that everybody can use, and you can basically make a game without any coding skills. So I think when we're talking about imagined futures, one of the futures that I would imagine is a very inclusive future in which people can eat bananas during meeting and it's not, not going to be uh, uh, turned around them in public afterwards <laughs> against them. You can write it in the manifesto. We will write tomorrow. Yes. The right to eat bananas. Uh -huh. um, speaking about the future, let's speak about the past uh, for a moment. Last year we focused uh, on the past very much. Uh, our leading, leading theme for, for those who don't know was um, living archives and we tried to look at various perspectives and ways in which contemporary artists can, uh, um, can take um, archives and uh, remix uh, works of art and uh, um, uh, discuss with the, you know, huge art and very important masters as well. Um, I remember that we also talked about uh, using memories in designing interactive stories. We paid a lot of attention to documentarism um, uh, and uh, journalism as well. And, um, and, and the way um, uh, new media can um, um, bring us closer to past events. Uh, but I think that even though this year we are focusing on the future very much, we are not um, forgetting about the past. And um, Anna, the, the workshop that Sophie and Ed are running is a good example of that. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, not only does the, the past uh, influence the future, but also visions of futures are something which have shaped 
the past. Exactly. So this is a workshop based on the 1962 film La Jeté, and uh, Sophie Dixon and Al Silverton will be running a workshop about how can we use archives or how can we use pictures uh, to tell and different media to tell stories. So we'll be exploring both uh, the whole, uh, narratives uh, and the tools that we can use to create stories uh, with uh, uh, the small elements. And it's on uh, uh, it's on Wednesday, so it's the 21st of October. Um, yeah, and it's going to be awesome. So <laughs> <2 p. laughs> I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, if it's my turn, it's yeah. my turn. Um, <laughs> in terms of, of um, uh, video games um, using uh, elements from the past and then imagining the future, uh, one of the centerpieces of our video game program this year is an interview with Mike Pondsmith, who is the creator of the Cyberpunk RPG system, which has right now become even more popular than it used to be because of the upcoming game uh, Cyberpunk 2077 by CD Projekt Red. Uh, but the interesting thing is Mike has been imagining this uh, future for the last 30 years, and it's a future uh, within this system that has been changing constantly with the developments in the real world. So it's a very interesting example of being partly immersed in the future and partly immersed in the past. And we're also going to talk about games uh, that you can see uh, on the screen right now. Um, Polish games which show visions of the future, some of them already released, some of them still in production. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see how they take elements from the present or from the past, as in this case, this is a screenshot from The Invincible, an adaptation of uh, Stanislaw Lem's novel, which is created in this retro-futuristic style, so it's a future as imagined in the past. Uh, this is Game Deck, an adaptation of the cycle of short stories and novels by Martin Przybyłek about a detective working in virtual reality and social media. And the, the last one is uh, Liberated, which is a dystopian vision of a future society based on surveillance. So these visions, the vision of the, of the detective investigating crimes in the social media, or the vision of uh, a society under total surveillance and people receiving credits for being good citizens, these, this is not just the future, right? This is the present uh, or the recent past, which has been extrapolated and which creates um, images of the future. I think these, these kind of visions are the most interesting ones. I would really love uh, Anna and Michał uh, to join our conversation. I, I strongly believe that film is a medium that will uh, refer to the past uh, very strongly. So Michał, Anna, can you comment on the film program here? I can comment on the film program and say that it's great and I love what you did, uh, Anna and Michał, curators of the film program. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if I could s start, uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, it's like the question of film as a tool, it's relevant here on two levels. First of all, uh, f the film as a, um, as a medium of, uh, or language of understanding reality and future as well, which is one, uh, one side of the, um, uh, of the of the program, one of the, the main uh, general questions, uh, which uh, could be probably seen the most in this experimental film that we would program, but also speaking on of the future and past, the past, when we look at the Polish and on the history of Polish cinema, because we were focused on um, on Polish culture and Polish cinema, uh, we could clearly see that there is some. Uh, uh, we had like many, many uh, visions of future in the uh, in the history of the Polish cinema, especially in the 80s. But there were mostly uh, mostly some dystopian um, visions, or uh, and also allegories of uh, of communist uh, regime. And then after uh, uh, after 90s, after the transformation, there was there is almost nothing till till nowadays. Um, but what's uh, what's important is that um, I, I have a feeling that uh, although we have almost no representation of future, as if 
Popols uh, can't imagine their future, uh, at least uh, through the cinema, um, which is uh, which is probably not true because it. Uh, I I think that this uh, these problems and this, uh, this this issues went through the went to the uh, to the art world, and we have many and artists, visual artists, uh, took it over, and we have many. Uh, many visions uh, and uh, and issues about uh, the the future in the uh, in the art world and uh, what we seen before were uh, were stills from the uh, the films uh, from the late 80s uh, which is a good example of what I said uh, which is punk legs in um, in space uh, which is uh, we could read it on the political uh, level. Um, it's full of anticipated transformation from the communist to free market capitalism and full of these uh, fantasies and, and hopes um, uh, about free market economy. Uh, but now uh, we, could see, we, we could see that it's, it's full of uh, modern, uh, also environmental uh, issues and concerns. For example, uh, Mr. Pex lives in the, um, in the last wildlife sanctuary on Earth, or it's a school, it's plankton because of its uh, sustainability, um, and so on. Um, but uh, as I said, uh, now there is we have uh, not uh, no such visions in the mainstream cinema, but. Uh, for example, film that uh, which opens the film program tonight it's a photon by uh, the Norman Leto, uh, which is a great example of uh, contemporary um, future visions of future, uh, but it's from the artwork, which is a very interesting shift, I guess. Thanks, Michal. Alex, would you like to jump in? Um. Not yet. Okay. Joe, I'm sure you would. Sure. Actually, it's a complimentary thing off the back of uh, Pavel earlier. Is, um, uh, we have uh, uh, one artist who's been working a lot in sound, Katarzyna Krakowiak, who um, we've been discussing a lot about the, the ethics of sound, but also how sound can translate and present value as well. And um, one of the common uh, areas we got to was the sound of Apple Pay. Um, which is that ever synonymous thing when you've made the payment you process an app or otherwise. And as someone that wouldn't want to admit that over the last few months, I've found myself playing Uno or Arthas uh, on online platforms as a means of communication and getting the mind flowing in a certain way. Um, however, the contradiction of the sound is that when you've made said payment, um, uh, you feel somewhat hopeful back in the game, back in the environment uh, that makes you feel somewhat accepted to be part of a platform. But actually, it's a false hope because it's sort of um, your resource that you are contributing here. So uh, we also focus on sound as a um, positive, but as a negative uh, uh, as well in some ways. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. I know what's the negative of sound is when <laughs> you're online, sometimes you don't <laughs> hear things very well. I don't know about the audience, but uh, just letting you, uh, Joe, know that your sound wasn't the best. So this is one of the negative parts of sound. But we can let your, we could read your lips because we're not wearing masks today. <laughs> it, 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 wasn't, okay. it wasn't that bad. I it mean, it was I'm just kidding. partly understandable. Uh -huh. Okay, Maybe uh, that was okay. no, no. I think we we I heard everything. I hope that our audience uh, has a better internet connection. Maybe, <laughs> and I'm moving to the next topic, which is internet. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I would like to uh, the talk for a moment about the internet, as old school as it seems, uh, and sounds. Um, we are more connected today for obvious reasons, more than ever. Um, I felt this very strongly during the, uh, the lockdown. I'm sure you also did. Um, but um, although the internet gives us many opportunities to connect with each other and to uh, sustain our, our daily routines, even if we are locked at uh, our homes, um, it's also um, a space um, um, full of inequalities, the same as 
you know, in real life, and sometimes we forget about this. Um, I think this is super important to uh, take this notion and to discuss about those issues, not only about uh, women inequalities, but also about gender and race inequalities. Uh, that's why we decided to um, uh, to discuss this uh, in the program uh, this year. And um, although we are on the first day of the of the festival, our closing keynote, uh, and I'm looking at Anna, will be discussing this uh, this topic. Uh, our closing keynote this year will be with uh, Charlotte Webb, uh, who's uh, working on creating a feminist internet. It will be moderated by Alek Tarkovsky from uh, Centrum Cyfrowe, uh, who is working with inclusive policies. And, um, well, it's going to be a very special keynote, so as is the opening keynote, which you will see later today because it's not a talk, but it's an animated talk. Our animator, uh, Marta Lisowska, made uh, great animations. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very, very enthusiastic for someone who's uh, insi inside the team. I'm, uh, I don't, I'm not very objective about this, but I think a lot of people have put a lot of effort in this year's edition. So it's uh, being enthusiastic about all the work that has been done by so many, so many people. So um, Charlotte's closing talk, which, which would come with animations, will tackle uh, the idea of how can we create an inclusive uh, internet for everyone. And I will be talking about feminist internet, but also wondering what aspects, what does it actually mean, and how can we recreate this, and how can digital culture, which is the main uh, topic of this event, uh, can help achieve that. So I think it will be also an interesting um, think to see these two perspectives, a perspective of someone who's a policymaker from Poland, Alek Tarkowski, who's, who's been using uh, culture as well in his practice, but he's basically a sociologist and someone who is a designer, who comes from an artistic perspective, but who's been working also on very similar issues from a different perspective. So, uh, yeah, I think... Uh, we would like to open this <laughs> event with, with talking about uh, inclusive futures, but also we'll be closing this event talking about uh, internet inclusive futures. Alex, um, maybe this is a moment. I think yeah, that your panel is very, uh, very relevant to this. Uh, Ingrid's and Anab's work, uh, for sure. Can you tell a, a little more about tomorrow's talk in this context? Um, and what I can do is <clears throat> certainly speak to, you know, kind of like the, the, the biases, you know, that are baked into everyday technology. Um, and I, I recently um, remember that just a, a couple of months ago, there was this huge controversy on Twitter uh, um, over uh, Twitter's image cropping uh, AI. And I'm sure that some of you have seen this. So essentially, Twitter users found out that the platform's cropping algorithm had a demonstrably preference for white people. So there was this example, like where an image that had both the uh, US uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and the former president of the US, Barack Obama, in it. And the AI would constantly crop to uh, Mitch McConnell, the white dude, right? So researchers looked into this, and they revealed that it's not just one problem, but as, in, as is often the case, kind of a cascade of technological flaws. So there was a system you know, that was built on another system, that was built on another system that then draws on another system that is trained on a biased data set. So um, as it turns out, and this is obviously no news, you know, equity and fairness is a real problem, is a real challenge when it comes to AI systems. They're essentially just layers of AI systems. So, and, and fixing this you know, um, goes far beyond fixing the technology. And, um, and, and, and it's uh, obviously something that concerns all of us. And, um, and in that context, it's certainly good to bring up uh, Ingrid Lafleur uh, from tomorrow's panel. Um, and she says um, that um, we need to be more self-reflective and work to decolonize our own minds. Without doing that self-check, you're likely doing uh, more harm than good. So. Um, for people who don't know Ingrid, um, Ingrid hosts the Decolonize Your Destiny podcast. Um, she also hosts the What Does Afrofuture Say? Um, that's a video se series. 
uh, on that you can find on YouTube. She's the founder of the Afrofuture Strategies Institute, a creative think tank and consultancy that promotes future literacy uh, with a particular focus on Africa and the Afri African diaspora. And um, so, um, yeah, she's an artist, she's a curator, she's an, uh, an activist first and foremost, and her active advocacy work, which I find really interesting and kind of all around these Afro-futurist principles, also served her as a platform to run for mayor of Detroit, the city that she lives in, and a city that, if you don't know, is 80% Afro-American. Afro and, um, and a lot of her work kind of centers around Detroit um, uh, and making it a better place. Um, so yeah, um, in that context, I'm really excited about tomorrow's panel where she will talk more about, you know, how, you know, how, you know, we can imagine more inclusive, more fair, more equitable futures. Thanks, Joe. I think it's good to mention Rebecca's work, uh, in this context as well. Absolutely. Now, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Now. Yes. Perfect. Okay, at the perfect segue here. Um, so that brings me to from Tuesday evening, we will air a work by um, visual artist and performance artist Rebecca Ubuntu, who has been exploring um, areas of Afrofuturism throughout her practice. And although coming from a installation, video art, and formative background, has worked on this audio formative work over the last three years, helped um, despair, hope, and healing, three movements for climate justice. So the work that will um, be aired from Wednesday, uh, uh, Tuesday, 9 p.m., um, is uh, uh, very much within the, uh, the, the, the context of the original exhibition um, by Olaf uh, Ellison that was co-commissioned uh, by Tate. And um, the context of the work was first conceived by Tate Britain. So there has been many iterations of this artwork in a physical form, but where we have brought this into the online world today and represented a degree of diversity and um, more political uh, direction is the use of uh, archive material. So the work itself is a tribute to uh, uh, the global BIPOC populations who um, contribute the least but are affected the most by climate collapse. Um, and it's an amplification of voices uh, from these communities in their fight for climate justice uh, and against environmental racism as well. It's, 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 it's also a dedication to the unique and fragile um, equilibrium of our, our planet's ecosystem, um, inspired by um, our words and, and messaging from black science fiction writer Octavia Butler. Um, so for sure, that will be a, a provocative but uh, hopefully motivational um, artwork uh, from Tuesday evening. Okay, um, Anya asked me to, 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 to speak now, so <laughs> I'll do so. Uh, Don't need words to communicate uh, at all. Thinking, thinking about, about um, more equal past in terms, uh, uh, sorry, future, mixing up the future and the past. Thinking of, of, of a more um, equal future in terms of digital, digital technologies and games again, I thought about the democratization of uh, game creation tools. Uh, it's a fascinating process, and uh, I'd say it's the next one in a whole sequence of processes, like the democratization of print, for instance, right? Which, uh, several decades ago, you had to go to a printer to print something out. Right now, you can print your own newspaper, print your own book at home. Uh, 3D printers... Why print, Pavel? Why print? Why print? Okay, well, just an example, right? Print because of Gutenberg, because of how, how this invention revolutionized or completely changed the, the uh, paradigm in which books functioned. And I think digital creation of all kinds is also becoming democratized. It's fascinating with games because um, uh, if you look at the early 2000s, uh, in order to make a game, you had to make it suited to certain market demands. And then with the indie game revolution and with tools that became easier and easier to work with, uh, you suddenly had uh, whole uh, minority groups suddenly gaining a voice. This was the case with uh, Twine, a tool used for uh, the creation of text adventures, which became um, very much dominated by queer authors 
who normally wouldn't have a place in mainstream games. Uh, and uh, right now there are loads of those tools. You have uh, the, the, the you have you had Bitsy that I already mentioned, and I think there are several examples of games on our program that wouldn't have been made but for these changes. I mentioned um, uh, queer groups making games, but we even have a game made by a quantum physicist, right? Uh, uh, a small indie game meant to teach quantum physics, uh, made in relatively simple tools, but quite interesting, quite appealing. So this is another side of this uh, huge uh, outpouring of different people who have access to tools which used to be very exclusive. And you can see uh, Piotr Migdaus and Klement Najankiewicz, who's the partner yeah, on this, this is, designer's uh, game it, during... Yeah, it's it's quantum game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Piotr Migdał, Klement Jankiewicz. It will be presented in uh, the Best of Poland section. When you were talking about the fact that, you know, there's some independent games which weren't there, I was thinking about the fact that, yeah, we need more independency right now. When we look back at, at the history of, uh, of the digital society, we need independency. Because uh, when the internet was created, it wasn't created by five big companies, on the contrary. And we will have also things in the programs addressing this, including the film uh, The Internet of Everything but Brett Gaylor, um, which uh, looks at how our data is being used and how our digital lives have become a commodity and uh, something that is being capital capitalized on. And we'll be looking at maybe utopians, but maybe also uh, accessible and possible uh, ways of uh, of reframing this and also reframing this narrative. We'll be talking about narratives a lot during the session. And uh, it's a screening, so basically uh, we will have this kind of cine club meeting um, with uh, Brett Gaylor and Jan Zygmuntowski. Um, and for those of you who are on the chat, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, drop a little um, joke. <laughs> that we'll be also addressing to so those of you who are signed up you can you can also um follow this and yeah so uh, the internet of everything but bread by bread gaylor it's in the film program most of the time the film program put put, put put together by Michał and Anya is Polish films, so from this tacky science fiction, things from the 80s to super interesting video art. Uh, but it's not only Polish, there's also foreign authors, and there's also uh, Brad's film, The Internet of Everything, on the program, and the meeting with the director as well. Tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Around that time, a little later. Uh, Joe, I think the, the audio program, speaking about subversive and provocative um, actions, I think this is also something that we can, uh, we can lean towards. Am I right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we actually have uh, two artists in the program. Uh, one of them I'll speak a bit later on, Erin G, but the first are Cavone, um, who's made a piece called Quiet Rush, and irrespective of what the, the narrative is about um, within the work, there's an element that advises you to do something, to get under the sink, uh, smell the oils, and put yourself in the confinement of something as a pre-setup, a precursor before the artwork begins. That coupled with the fact that um, as time goes by and as, a, as, as, as age continues in the digital world, more and more people having Google speakers and uh, Alexas in their home. And through many conversations with artists over the last six months leading into this program, many would say some words that sound a little like, OK, Google, and would end up connecting and instigating the speaker in my house. And, that, and out of that came out theories of intrusion and um, the barriers, your your limitations and your barriers that you set so people can't intrude your your environment from a digital space. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue to address that further in Erin G um, and Sophia and Audrey's work of the soon later on. 
We will come back to RNG for sure. Uh, now I would like to move on to other very important topic. I think even more important now um, during the pandemic, uh, which is uh, the growth and uh, and sustainability. Um, I think this is the the bright side of the of the pandemic and and of COVID that many art institutions had to rethink the way they tackle um, blockbuster exhibitions and you know big international events uh, taking place uh, around the globe um, uh, all the time. Um, I think um, the fact that we were unable to travel and artworks were unable to travel um, overseas also made us, I'm talking about you know, people who work in the arts industry, but not only, uh, made us think about, about the way we approach our audience, audiences uh, in different ways than before. Um, um, we also talked about this uh, in past years, uh, about overproduction, um, uh, and and online collections, constantly gr growing online collections, right? We uh, even created uh, a term which was called the big feast. Um, uh, I think now it's even bigger because many more institutions and artists produce uh, things uh, made for online purposes. Uh, and we would like to reflect on that um, after a few months of, uh, of, of the state and see how, uh, how, we can, um, how we can operate in this different mode uh, and what lessons we learned so far. Um, so Joe, can you uh, tell us more about this? Because you're running a panel about the growth uh, in a couple of days uh, with uh, great speakers, not only from Poland, but also from, from abroad. Absolutely. So as Anna mentioned, on Wednesday, uh, between 6 and 7.15, uh, we have a panel, how art institutions can welcome the notion of degrowth. And so I think, I think this is also extremely relevant to how we've been approaching uh, set up with uh, uh, digital cultures this year as well, because um, you simply cannot have a method in place so many months before and just stick to that same one. You have to very much adapt with the times and go back to your research. It's never just the end result. It's the tools that you use in the beginning. So we we welcome three speakers, um, uh, one, uh, one from Poland, one from Germany, one from uh, Austria. So we have Christoph Platz, from Städtische Herbst, uh, which is a festival based in Graz. And uh, he will be talking about his festival um, that occupies uh, many, many venues across the city as festivals often occupy temporary spaces for their circus mentality as the festival comes to town. Um, but we'll be talking about um, how creating a hybrid version of a festival isn't just a tool for artistic engagement and audience engagement, um, but for environmental, environmentally friendly purposes and financial purposes um, as well. Um, that then go, uh, uh, translates into um, a, a brief talk by Diane Drube, uh, who is the co-founder of We Are Museums, um, where they'll be talking about how their organization's primary focus is uh, bringing communities together in certain territories around the world, looking at how we can better um, uh, 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 construct an artistic output, but one of the more important areas in her, uh, her talk is about placement of staff around the world, as opposed to the need of travel um, around the world as well. So we'll be looking into areas of degrowth for sure. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. Um, Anya, can you comment uh, on this uh, with the film program? I know that there is uh, at least one film that uh, you could refer to. Uh, yes, White Cube by Polish visual artist Wojtek Pustoła exemplifies the problem of the degrowth, but not the digital degrowth, but rather the physical degrowth. And rather than proposing the solutions, uh, it poses uh, questions about the limits of art. Um, this film is um, a creative documentary uh, and an example of a slow cinema. Uh, it tells the story of Carrara. Uh, it is an Italian town that is famous for the white marble extracted there. 
And in the film, we can observe uh, modern technology shaking uh, the foundations of this world with uh, the development of a robot called Anthropomorpho. Uh, and this robot uh, was created by one of the local uh, sculptors um, as his assistant. Uh, but soon it turned out that the robot is, is much quicker and uh, the local craftsmen uh, may soon drive Carrara sculptors uh, out of business. Uh, because uh, with uh, this robot, the Anthropomorpho, anyone from around the world uh, can submit their 3D projects um, of a sculptures uh, by email and receive a marble sculpture soon after, even a few days. Uh, so the birth of this robot poses the questions like what does it mean to work on a piece of art today and what exactly an artwork today is uh, and also is the mass production of sculptures uh, by robots respectful to natural resources. Uh, and I really encourage you to watch uh, this movie on Thursday. Thank you. Miha, would you like to add something to the film program? Uh, yes, uh, because we have one, one of uh, one of our short experimentals, which uh, will be shown on um, uh, Tuesday evening in the um, in the set called uh, Plants Hope. Um, it dire directly addresses this problem of overproduction, and actually, it's. Uh, it's probably the only f film um, in our program which which is uh, which have been made uh, during the, the pandemic times, which is, is it's very recent and it's uh, it's usually about the problem of overproduction and this is like the vision of the future um, in which plants are taking over the art world and the all, the whole production uh, of the of the art and the whole art industry is stops and uh, the institutions museums biennials uh, like uh, consciously uh, turning themselves or like closing or letting um, those uh, the, the venues to be overgrown by weeds uh, etc like to give to space to non-humans plants animals uh, yeah, which is which is very uh, the bold uh, and interesting vision of the of the future after 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 apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also great, you know, with the film program that you keep saying Tuesday if Thursday Thursday evening, but basically it's Tuesday it's premieres on Tuesday evening here in Poland where we're from, uh, where, where we where we're in, but uh, it can be viewed for two days actually um so the program will be on for two days and this gives also uh this uh possibility for people to see it from different places in the world and i think this notion of this asynchronic 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 um, presence is something which we have learned to appreciate uh in the past months and also new forms of physicality and we'll be also addressing this topic, this new physicality, in one of the four sections that we have uh, uh, devoted to the best of Poland. Uh, to this, there's a section called Best of Poland, which is uh, showing uh, the most interesting, inspiring projects that we've curated uh, uh, from Poland. So there's four of these, and it's kind of a forum. So you will have presentations from a variety of artists working in the digital spheres. So if you're not joining from Poland, or if you're joining from Poland, and you would like to see what is happening in the scenes, uh, it's it's a very unique opportunity to meet the Polish creators. So there will be presentations, there will be talks, and one of the talks is actually about this new physicality and the way we can uh, we new ways of um, of appreciating the physical environment, new ways of uh, creating materiality. How do we take an algorithm and we'll make it material? So we'll be also uh, showing projects who uh, address this. But there's four sections of Best of Poland, uh, which we everyone to have a look at. Absolutely. I think it's a paradox that we uh, we are so distanced from each other uh, during this year's festival, but we will talk about physicality and about uh, materiality that much, and also about nature. Um, 
but I was thinking about this when, when I was browsing through the program, actually, recently, that uh, nature uh, seems like a solace uh, in times of, uh, um, you know, when you're overwhelmed with technology, right? But um, nature is in troubles at the moment as well. Uh, it's in a huge crisis. Uh, can it still be a solace for us? Uh, uh, in in a moment of um, uh, of that um, serious troubles that uh, it's going through, uh, what do you think? Can we uh, lean towards nature and uh, and look for solace there or uh, or not? Of course, I, I, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> right, I'm a bit intimidated by this huge screen, but of course, if you were wondering, these plants are all real. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I was wondering even now during this panel <laughs> we have we have some sort of bias and and there are there are lots of other plans uh, which you unfortunately can't see because the camera is not directed towards them but but there are lots of plants in the studio to to make us feel a bit less lonely oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> you, you got a shot of that uh, yes I think this is this it's uh, you mentioned this paradox I think this hunger for materiality this hunger for the natural is something that's very strongly present in digital culture right now. Uh, it's also a very important motif in video games, uh, where, where you get uh, more and more complex algorithms used to create uh, trees and plants, for instance. Or you get little meditative ex um, uh, uh, examples like this. This is a fragment from a, a game called The Novena by uh, Cecile Richards. I mentioned her workshops a moment ago. She works in Bitsy. And it's a game about going to talk to the sea every day. And you can see the different uh, kinds of weather uh, and the different shapes of the waves. And, uh, and this is something that you can, this, this also fits the degrowth team, right? As you can see, it's a very minimalist thing. Uh, another example, uh, if we could jump to that, uh, the, to, the, to the screenshots. Uh, is Werewolf the Apocalypse, Heart of the Forest, uh, which is a, a Polish video game that's just been released. Uh, and it's a, it's a game uh, based on the um, Werewolf RPG franchise, which moves it to the Polish region of the Białowieża Forest, Puszcza Białowieska. Uh, and, uh, and it is literally about, because the werewolf RPG is about being a werewolf. So it's literally about finding the animal in yourself. And it's about th this, this primal experience of going to the forest and then finding some kind of violent but fascinating animal nature uh, within yourself and getting in touch with it. So this is another Best of Poland presentation that's, that, that we're going to look at. Guys, we need to uh, wrap up soon, but before we do that, I would like to read one question that yeah. uh, we have. Um, a question from Saviano Rua. Sorry if I misspell your name. Um, in your view, will a better future be only or mainly digital or be real too? despite reality being much harder to change than the digital. P.S. Thanks, uh, thanks and con congratulations for having created this event. I think it's something that we'll be talking about during the workshop, Tim's workshop, right? We'll be speculating about futures. Very true. <clears throat> Tim's workshop um, will be speculating about futures. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's, um, it's um, sort of... Um, um, kind of uh, our attempt to to uh, to um, you know have to follow up all this theory you know that we will talk about tomorrow with a little bit of practice and it's um, yes it's a critical futures workshop um, it happens next Friday at four p.m. and Tim will sort of use his uh, infamous Twitter thread uh, what could possibly go wrong as a starting point for teaching participants how to turn cynicism, snark, and satire into useful storytelling tools. So, yeah, it's about kind of coming up with alternate scenarios and, you know, kind of be a little whimsical about it. But then you can sort of learning how you can use, um, you know, narrative and fiction to come up with possibly, hopefully, better futures. 
I don't know if that people... really answered the question of the audience. Yeah, I think it's a very difficult question, and this is why we're putting this program together. I think there's like many possible visions of the future, and it's very, very difficult actually to have a uh, to, to to give a straightforward answer. But this is why we'll be continuing this conversation for the next yeah. uh, uh, 10 days, almost for the next uh, week. And I happen to have a Teams book here for all those of you who haven't read it yet. Um, so I totally recommend reading it and I totally recommend joining both the, um, the workshop and the panel that Tim will be uh, moderating. And on my pile of books, I have a second book as well, so I can show it <laughs> right away as well. Uh, so this is, um, this is a, a book by, uh, if we had like an audience here, I would ask the Polish audience, who thinks Julian Tuvim, Tuvim is great and who loves Lokomotiva? And I'm pretty sure that everybody would raise their hands. Lokomotiva is a poem by Julian Tuvim. And uh, based on, um, on the thought of Julian Tuvim, who is a Polish poet in a way, uh, who brings really different things together, uh, this book which I have here is called Ticer cum Kaule which means groch z kapustą, which means hodgepodge, which means mixing everything with everything, with like this cooking vibe. And I, I think and this is also kind of an, the, the, the answer to, to the question, uh, because uh, the, the question was about the opposition okay, wanna, between... I want to go with the workshop. You want to go with the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's good to go, come back to the question and then go on with the workshop. <laughs> Uh, it just hit me as a, as a good way of tackling the question because um, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the opposition between the digital and the natural. And I think what we should aim at is precisely this hodgepodge uh, where it no longer is treated as an opposition. Right? We won't escape the digital, definitely. Hopefully we won't lose too much of nature. We've already lost too much. So we, we will have to think about ways not of putting the two against each other or trying to make one overcome the other, but we'll have to think of ways of the two coexisting or, or somehow merging together, right? Uh, I don't know in what form, uh, I know in or, what or, form. Or, or with what practice. I have yeah, an I idea. Mean, this, okay, I so have here, an idea here's where we go, go back <laughs> to the workshops. So we have this idea, we had this idea of uh, how do we make this digital more tangible and more physical, and how do we talk about the fact that we, there's this, we think about uh, the digital being really intangible and uh, about nature and culture and about genders being maybe two separate things. And we wanted to mix it all together. So this, uh, this is why I was talking about hodgepodge. So we're mixing everything together, the, nat the natural, the digital, uh, in a workshop that <laughs> I will have the, pre the pleasure to co-run, which explains AI and how algorithms work. Uh, with uh, in a very nice and physical process of making Polish dumplings pierogi. So uh, on the last weekend of the of the festival, uh, we will have a group of participants, everyone in their own place, making Polish pierogi and learning this very physical skills while also learning um, how does this technology that technology that will be shaping our future work. And it will also be on Zoom. Everybody will be in their kitchens. No. I mean, w not every. We w it won't be streamed. Yeah, right? yeah, but people no. will be in their kitchens. Yes. So. Uh, but also talking about technology and about AI, I think uh, another f uh, another uh, thing which I could recommend to anybody interested in AI is the film by Yves Jelly. Yeah, I wanted to mention this. We re really need to wrap up, but okay, let's yeah, just... So, uh, so Yves Jelly yes. and uh, Aleksandra Przegalinska. Aleksandra Przegalinska is a Polish AI philosopher. Yves Jelly is a, is a filmmaker and a photographer. And they will be together discussing uh, how robots uh, interact with humans uh, based on this very beautiful film that Eve made with elderly people in retired in in this um, house, houses uh, uh, in France and in Belgium, I think. Can we uh, present a few stills, please? Oh yeah, this would be it's very beautiful. So I think we would totally want to. This have is a look something at the, uh, yeah. good to end with. Uh, if also, because the, f the film is about getting old, and I think as long as we may be talking about. Um, imagined futures, but I think as long, I mean, for now, I think all of us humans inhabiting this planet, we have one very foreseeable future, which is that we're just here for a moment. So I think this, fi this film also 
addresses this um, in a very delicate way. Absolutely. Yeah, here are the, the stills. I saw it uh, last year. I, I think we saw it together at ITFA. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful film and we re really encourage you to join us uh, also for the discussion. It's on Thursday, October 22nd, 8 p.m. at exactly. BSD. Exactly, yes. Guys, thank you so much. Um, um, I had a great pleasure of working with you and I hope it will be reflected in the program and that uh, you will be also having a pleasure to spend nine days with us. Uh, as, I, as I said, take your own pace. Don't rush, just relax uh, with the film program, uh, go for a walk with the audio program, uh, spend some time with the online exhibition that we present in cooperation with the Patch Lab Festival, and do whatever you want to do with, uh, with other elements of the program because it's really easy to navigate and you can also um, uh, watch it from anywhere uh, in the world. So we really encourage you to join us live and to ask questions uh, during the panels. Um, uh, thank you for being with us today and uh, now we will have a short Break I really before we to move in. on to uh, Julia Kagańskis. I really want to get in because I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all the people who you don't see. And I'm going to just break the fourth wall. We're sitting in a studio and there's plenty of people behind this camera who helped us out. So it's not only, you know, the. Can we, can we, show, some, or, uh, can we show them? Is there any way we can show them? Can we have, show like, the, studio the studio again? Yeah, well, you don't <laughs> no, see them either, they're, they're but uh, there's a lot yeah. of people who helped us, so I just wanted to say it's not the, the, the seven of us, it's been a great uh, effort of the entire team, whom I really want to thank, and this is why I thought it's important to maybe yes. make it two minutes longer, but to acknowledge this amount of work that has been done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.